Redeemer seems now I see him on Calvary. 
to the Lord's gathering. We can't be together in God's house, but in the Spirit, through His Holy Spirit and through our Spirit, we are one. And I welcome you to this Palm Sunday message. I'm going to begin, as we always do, with uh, what we always call our circle prayer. Let's pray together. Our Heavenly Father, I thank you, God, for this day. I thank you, Lord, for the celebration of the coming of the King of Kings. Today, Lord, I pray for each person that's hearing my voice, and I just ask God your blessing upon them. Lord, you know each and every one, and even though, Lord, we are uh, separated by this uh, virus, Lord, we are united in you. And I pray, God, that the fellowship of your Holy Spirit would draw us ever closer to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, today I hope you are doing well. I hope that uh, cabin fever is not getting the best of you. And um, I just want to encourage you. Um, you know, it's, uh, it's good to get some exercise, and, but it's also good to exercise your faith. Exercising your body, the Bible says, has a little benefit. And exercising your faith has tremendous benefit exercising your relationship with Christ. Uh, it's good for your spiritual health, it's good for your well-being, and it's very good for your mental health, too. Uh, being thankful is always a great way. I want to encourage you to uh, keep up with the announcements from the church. Those will be on our Facebook page and on our church website. Uh, those uh, numbers uh, will be on the, uh, uh, on the video as well today. But today, as we uh, continue, let's look into the Word of God. This is, of course, uh, Palm Sunday, and uh, I'm going to be reading from the book of Matthew, Gospel of Matthew, chapter 21. I'll give you a moment to take uh, your Bible and turn to chapter 21 of the Gospel of Matthew, and I'll be reading uh, the first 10 verses. Um, this is a, um, a story that um, has many aspects and many facets to it. Uh, those of us that are parents, uh, maybe you've been at uh, a little league game or a football game or something, or some other event, maybe uh, an academic event or uh, a spiritual uh, event in the life of your child. Where we've had those moments when we say, that's my boy, or that's my child. And as we look at the triumphal entry today, I would like to look at it from the perspective of man, the perspective of Christ, and the perspective of God the Father. Because I really believe that for God the Father, this was a that's my boy moment. Let's look at the Word of God in Matthew chapter 21, verses 1 and following. As they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethpage on the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and at once you will find a donkey tied there with her colt by her. Untie them. And bring them to me. And if anyone says anything to you, tell them the Lord needs them. And he will, uh, he will send them right away. This took place to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet. Say to the daughter of Zion, See, your king comes to you, gentle and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. 
the disciples went and did as Jesus had instructed them. They brought the donkey and the colt, placed their cloaks on them, and Jesus sat upon them. A very large crowd spread their cloaks, uh, spread their cloaks on the road, while others cut branches from trees and spread them on the road. The crowds went ahead of him, and those following shouted, Hosanna to the Son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. When Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred and asked, Who is this? Well, let's ask God to bless the word. Our Father in heaven, this is your word. And God, I pray that as your word goes forth, that you would open our hearts and our ears and help us, God, to see and hear your word, to embrace it and to understand it in our spirit. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Well, that last verse, when it says that the people looked and when Jesus came, they said, who is this? This is an amazing narrative. It's actually the fulfillment of biblical prophecy. In the book of Zechariah, this passage uh, quotes where it says that, uh, Say to the daughter of Zion, See your king comes to you, riding on a donkey's colt. Uh, from the standpoint of man, it's interesting, this question, who is this? That was a central question in Jesus' life. It was a question that many people asked him. John the Baptist sent disciples and said, uh, ask Jesus, are you the one that has been sent? What he's talking about is from the very beginning, from the very promise in the Garden of Eden, again the promise to Abraham, the father of faith, to Moses and to David, the great king of Israel, this promise had been passed to him that one day God would send a redeemer, and that redeemer would deal with the brokenness that's in this world. You know, we uh, use the term history, and if you divide that into two sections, it's his story. We actually divide time from B.C., meaning before Christ, into A.D., which means in the year of our Lord. It comes from the Latin. Time itself is divided by the coming of Christ. And the promise that God had made was that the creator of this world understood the brokenness of this world after the sin of Adam and Eve. That sin became a part of this world. And the Bible actually says that all of creation suffers under the burden of sin, under the fallenness of this world. God himself has intervened in this world. When they said, who is this? That's a great question. It's a question every man, every woman has to ask at some point in your life. If this individual was so relevant and important in our lives and in our existence, that history itself is divided based on his coming. The question everyone should ask, who is this? And who is he to me? In the eyes of man, when Jesus sat upon that donkey's colt, you have to understand that in the culture that he was in, in the Jewish culture, the people were anticipating a redeemer, a savior, and a king. When Jesus began to preach, people began to ask, who are you? Who are you to say the things you're saying? Who are you that you can say to a person, your sins are forgiven? In Jesus' day, as in ours too, anyone who claims the right to be able to forgive sin is either a very special person, they're either God or they're a very bad person, they're a blasphemer. The Pharisees rightly said, only God can forgive sin. 
And the question of who Jesus was, was that was the question of the day. Eventually, Jesus, at the, almost at the end of his life, says to his disciples, I want you to go and I want you to get this donkey and her foal. And I want you to bring that donkey to me. And outside of the city of Jerusalem, and Jerusalem was a unique city. It still is. Jerusalem is the city where God at one time said, this is where I will manifest my presence of all the world. I have chosen this place where I will be worshipped, where I will be met with, and where I will be with my people. When Jesus came into Jerusalem, <clears throat> it was not an incidental thing. It wasn't that Jerusalem was just a handy place. No, Jerusalem was a chosen place, and it was a chosen time. It was nothing about this was incidental or coincidental. Everything about this was scripted, and it was scripted by God himself, even the very timing of this riding into Jerusalem on a donkey's colt. The significance of riding in on that donkey's colt, Jesus was identifying with the Messiah who was prophesied in the Old Testament. Sin came into the world there in the Garden of Eden. God had, at various times, dealt with sin by judgment. In this case, God was about to deal with sin through mercy and through grace. The narrative from the eyes of man. People were seeing this, and they had longed for this Redeemer. They had longed for their king. And when he rode into Jerusalem on that donkey's colt, there were many who said, that is an answer to prayer. That is in accordance with Scripture. As Jesus rode in on the donkey's colt, there were those who shouted, Hosanna, Hosanna. There were those who saw this and realized these people were worshiping him. And many of those of the Pharisees said, you have got to tell people to stop doing this because no one can be worshiped except God. And Jesus' reply was, if they remain silent, the rocks themselves will cry out. In other words, the creation would praise the Creator because the one riding on the donkey's colt was responsible for the existence of the rocks themselves, as well as the donkey, as well as the colt, as well as the people, even as well as the pathway made from the dust that he had called into existence. John's Gospel tells us that this same Jesus is the one who spoke in Genesis 1 and said, let there be light. John tells us that everything that was made was made by him. The eyes of flesh, the eyes of man. You had those who had questions about who he was. You had those who despised him because of what they saw. You had those who had a measure of faith even though their steps of faith were kind of like baby steps. And then you had the mind of Jesus himself. What do you think Jesus was thinking? Jesus had a unique perspective on this. He himself knew that within a week of this time, he would be crucified. But he also recognized that this was the timing of his father, the precise day that he rode in to Jerusalem, the precise location of where this took place, the praise that came. And when Jesus said, if they remain silent, the rocks will cry out. He as the Lord Almighty, the King of Kings, realized that this moment had to be at the time when many didn't know what to make of him. Many praised him because 
they believed that he would be what they wanted him to be and were later disappointed and later abandoned him, even his own disciples. And yet Jesus Christ knew that as the Lord of glory, riding into Jerusalem on that time, was something that would cause praise to resound. And he says, if the people here don't do it, the rocks will cry out. What do you think the angels in heaven were doing? I believe that that day the angels in heaven rejoiced with the thunderous applause and praise and glory. The parade that Jesus saw going into Jerusalem that day must have paled in comparison to the glory of the angelic host who from, time, from the very time of their own creation had worshipped him with eyes of, with, with their very own eyes and their very own hands. And what about God the Father? Well, God the Father recognized that this was his son's shining moment. Heaven and earth proclaimed that Jesus Christ was king. The, pro the proclamation in heaven was unhindered. The proclamation on earth was entirely limited. It was limited by a few who recognized him as the true Messiah, by some who recognized him as a hope, a hope of something better for themselves. His earthly experience was marred by those who disdained him because his proclamation of who he is. But in accordance with scripture, his testimony was clear. This is the one. I am the one. I am the Messiah. There was no misunderstanding about that, except for those who chose to misunderstand it. This was the proclamation that the earth pondered and reflected. Who is this? And heaven erupted in glorious praise. This is the king of kings. The king is coming. He's coming into the city where he promised that he would reign. The great question is, who was in charge? You know, the Pharisees thought they were in charge. Pontius Pilate thought he was in charge. They wrestled over who had authority. They wrestled over who would control the circumstances, just like our people do today. Our politicians, our mighty people, uh, people of industry, they all argue over who's going to have control. The truth of the matter is, the only one that ever is truly in control is God. And God was in control on Palm Sunday when Jesus rode into Jerusalem on a donkey's colt. He came in glory. And he came in power. He did not come in weakness. He did come in humility. And he came in all of his glory. And he came to conquer and to occupy. But not like many people wanted him to. They wanted him to become an earthly king. He came to destroy the destroyer. He came to break the power of Satan. He came to set captives free. He came to liberate those who long had been bound in sin and oppression. Not just oppression of the flesh, but oppression of the soul. And he came to redeem his own. And you know what? He's still in control. Our God reigns, and he alone is the king. He always was, he always has been, and he always will be. He isn't the king because of what he did. What he did, he did because he is the king. We have an illusion that we're in control, and the truth be told, we're not. Have we not found that out in the midst of this pandemic? Have we not found out that everyone wants someone to do something? The politicians point their fingers and blame each other. The medical professionals go back and forth. This is what's best. That's what's best. The truth of the matter is the only one who's really in control of much of anything around here is God Almighty. He always has been. And the fact that we are seeing the demonstration 
of human frailty in the midst of this pandemic doesn't change the fact that God is in control. Our God reigns, and he is the king, and he's sovereign. That word sovereign means that he is absolutely in control. And nothing, and no one, nothing in heaven or nothing in earth or nothing in hell itself is able to change the fact that God is in control. Maybe you're afraid because of what's been going on. Maybe you're troubled. A lot of people are. Some folks are more afraid than they care to admit. Other folks, uh, uh, I've had folks tell me, I'm, I'm scared. And you know, I can understand that. These are scary times. But you remember what Jesus said. Do not let your heart be troubled. When I was a little kid, maybe you too, we learned a song called, He's Got the Whole World in His Hands. And he does. He still does. God never lost his grip. Truth be told, everything that we think we've controlled, he's been the one controlling it all along. Sometimes we're like little kids. You know, sometimes when we're very small, our parents are holding us up and we think we're doing things ourselves. Well, it's that way with God. We're not really in control. A lot of folks are afraid. A lot of folks are troubled. They're troubled in their spirit. You know, we sing the hymns, trust and obey. Well, there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. Putting your faith in Jesus Christ during these troubled times, it's not denying anything good. It's simply acknowledging things that go way beyond us. It goes beyond uh, the physical realm. It goes beyond science and physics and technology. It's interesting. Uh, uh, Y2K, we saw the frailty of technology. We realized that technology can't do anything on its own. It can only do what it's programmed to do. And we forgot to program it the way we should have in the first place. We realized technology can't fix us. It only serves us. And we found that our, our strength and our might, our might is limited, always has been. God is not limited. When Jesus Christ rode into Jerusalem on that donkey, he proclaimed to the world, I am the king. And he's not a king. He wasn't the first king that rode into Jerusalem. Many kings had ridden in Jerusalem. Some of them were foreign invaders. They rode in Jerusalem and looted and pillaged and killed and, and just tore everything up. Some rode into Jerusalem in great victory. David had ridden into victory, uh, into Jerusalem in victory. He danced before the Lord when the Ark of the Covenant was brought back into Jerusalem and when it was placed inside the temple. Many had entered Jerusalem in victory before, but nobody, nobody had ever entered in Jerusalem like Jesus did. David was only a prototype of the great king to come. Sometimes we have to acknowledge that Jesus Christ always was the king. He was the king before Palm Sunday. He was the king after Palm Sunday. He was the king on Good Friday when he hung on the cross. Even Pilate announced that by placarding above his head, the king of the Jews. But he's not just the king of a nation of people on this earth. He is the king of all kings. And one of these days the Bible says that every knee will bow before him. When you're afraid, and your heart is troubled, you need to remember that he's got the whole world in his hands. We sang that as little kids. We learned the hymn, Trust and Obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. Sometimes fear, sometimes disquieting in the spirit, sometimes it comes forth in anger. You know, a lot of folks are worried that here over the next few weeks that tempers are going to boil. Uh, a lot of jokes have been made about that on Facebook. 
but unfortunately the truth is that it's probably going to wear people's nerves down. We've had a couple of weeks of this and a lot of folks are feeling like I'm reaching the end of myself. Well, you know what? Maybe that's part of God's plan too. Ever so often we need to reach the end of ourself. We need to understand how limited we are. We, we understand that science is limited, technology is limited, medicine is limited, government is limited. Every human element, every human thing is limited. I am limited. I am not by nature mild-mannered and good. My limitation is that my sinful flesh still waits for an opportunity. And a lot of folks are worried that through this pandemic, through the isolation, through the lack of control, the lack of freedom, that they're going to lose control themselves. They're going to get angry. And when I realize how quickly that can happen to me, I need to remember who's in control. The King has come. And it is the Lordship of Christ, not the strength or the inner will of man, of me or you, the only one that has the power for life and liberty and hope and peace and joy is the one who commanded the attention of the entire creation on Palm Sunday almost 2,000 years ago when he rode into that town and the people, and there were many of them, began to praise and glorify him from his perspective. I can imagine he might have thought, this is, it's about time. And it was so important that he said, even if the people didn't praise him, the rocks themselves would cry out. Jesus Christ, from his perspective, saw this not out of ego for himself, because of his glory. It had to be. There had to be praise because the Almighty, the maker of heaven and earth, the King of kings and the Lord of lords was being recognized in heaven and earth. And the perspective from God. God, I can imagine God's heart and spirit swelled with pride. The unity that exists between the Father and the Son has never been broken. It never has and it never will be. But the Father exalted the Son and the Son exalted the Father. Our Heavenly Father saw His Son, His one and only Son. Both the Father and the Son knew that within a few days the praise and the glory of man would turn into jeers and shouts of crucify him. It's hard to imagine. For those of us that know and love the Lord Jesus Christ, we can imagine ourselves adding our voices to the, to the rancor and the cries for him to be crucified. But then again, Peter couldn't imagine him denying Christ either. That's what the frailty of humanity looks like. God the Father had said on a few occasions, this is my son in whom I am well pleased. I have to believe that in that moment when earth and heaven erupted in praise, that the Father stood in praise and glory of his son, Jesus Christ. God is in control. He always has been. The fact that he knew that this same Jerusalem would be within days a place of his death, he also knew that it wasn't because of the plan of man, that it was because of the plan of the Father. It was his Father who set the schedule and the time frame for Jesus' ride into Jerusalem as well as for his arrest as well as for his torment and his crucifixion. It was the Father who set the time for his resurrection from the dead. God was up to something. 
and the world didn't know it. Jesus knew it, but even his closest disciples didn't understand. A few days later on Good Friday, when they gathered with him in the upper room, and he began to explain to them what was about to happen, they says, no, this, this cannot be. Even Peter tried to, uh, in, tried to impede him, tried to hinder him. And Jesus said, get thee behind me, Satan. God was up to something. He was up to something then. And what he was up to was the redemption of all mankind through the suffering of Christ, through his crucifixion, through his death, burial, but also his glory and his resurrection when Christ would come forth from the grave, victorious over it. Is God up to something now? You know, I've had folks ask me that question about this pandemic. It's a worldwide thing. That's really what the term pandemic means. Pandemic has to do with the scope of the geographical location more than the numbers. But the truth be told, this has gone throughout the world. And I've had people ask me, is God up to something? Well, I believe that the answer to that is a definite yes, he is. And the reason I say that is not because God has given me special inside information. And I don't believe he's given that inside information to anybody else. But the information he has given to us is adequate and enough. In fact, it's more than enough for me to understand that, yes, God is up to something every day and every moment, every hour of every day. God is up to something. But here is something else that is painfully obvious from the scriptures. Is God up to something? Let me ask you a question. Have we not, as a people, turned from him and from his commandments? Have we not forgotten to be thankful for the many blessings that now we may realize we have taken for granted? You know, many of us have grown up in a time and a place where we don't know much about hunger unless we see it in somebody else. We don't know much about suffering because there's been so many advancements in healthcare and medicine that much of the suffering that used to be common, that used to be part of every culture and almost every life, we have seen that kind of suffering abated through uh, painkillers. Maybe we have forgotten how good God has been to us. Have we not broken our promises to God? Even though he has been faithful in all of his promises to us, hundreds and thousands of ways God has kept his promises. He has continued to shed grace upon us time after time. And our response has been an accelerated abandonment of everything that God has commanded of truth, of justice, and of righteousness. You know, neither of those things are very common in our world today. In Second Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14, it says, If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked way, I will hear them in heaven and I will forgive their sins and I will heal their land. That was spoken in the days of Solomon almost 3,000 years ago. God was talking to his people. He wasn't talking to the unbelieving world. He was talking to his own. Has God spoken to me in a mystical way? No, God has spoken to me in his word, and his word is clear, that God blesses righteousness and that God will judge disobedience, that God will judge wickedness. Psalm 1 says that the righteous will be like a tree by streams of water that will yield its fruit in season and whose leaf will not wither. That's the blessing of God to those who love him and love his righteousness and adhere to him. 
but it says, Not so the wicked. They are like chaff that the wind blows away. As disappointed as Almighty God must be in what he sees in this world, I believe God is much more disappointed in what he sees by those that are called by his name. We call ourselves Christians, little Christs. If my people, who are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray, and seek my face, and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear them from heaven. You know, we in the church have a way of wagging our fingers at the unbelieving world, pointing out their sin. Well, their sin is sin, but so is ours. So is yours, and so is mine. And the problem that I see is not so much what the unbelieving world fails to do. I believe the problem is what the church of Jesus Christ fails to do. It's the unbelieving world. They need to see a church that believes what the Word of God says. They need to see a church that acts like the church. They need to see us showing humility toward God and a, a heart for justice and for righteousness. The Bible tells me not to spend as much time pointing my finger at the sins of others as it does that I should take care of what's in my own backyard. When my people who are called by my name, the unbelieving world needs to see a church that looks like Jesus Christ. The unbelieving world needs to see a church that says, I want to be clean and I want to be pure. I want to be all that God has called me to be. I want to walk in a way that is worthy of the name of Christ. And I want Jesus Christ to be proud of me. I want my Savior to be as proud of me as his father was when he rode in Jerusalem on Palm Sunday. God says, when my people do that, I'll hear them from heaven. I will forgive their sin, and I will heal their land. I want to see that in my life. I want to see that in the life of the body of Christ, the church. I want to see us so in love with Christ and so humble before him that whatever he would command of us, we would do. He deserves nothing less. The king has commissioned us. The great commission that says, go and make disciples, not converts. And we're not supposed to be out there trying to redeem the world ourselves. We are to go call people to Christ. We are to introduce them to this king of kings. We are to call them to repentance from sin, to faith. We are to call them to look toward him, not so much toward us. We are called to be faithful. We are called to be holy. If he is your king, then it is time for you to submit to the lordship of Christ. Not lip service, not just attendance. We grieve because we can't be in attendance. But I believe God's heart grieves because we are not attentive to him. If he is your king, it is time to submit yourself to his lordship. It is time for you to humble yourself and pray and seek his face and to, for us to turn from our wicked way. If Jesus Christ is not the king of your life, if he is not the Lord of your life, this is exactly the right time for you to surrender your being to him and to his lordship. The lordship of Jesus Christ is not up for debate any more than his lordship and his majesty was a matter of debate when he rode into Jerusalem on that donkey. It was a proclamation, not a uh, vote. It was Jesus Christ saying, proclaiming, I am the king. He still is. 
His lordship is not a matter for debate. The judge will come, and as many as believe will be taken with him. His majesty is not in question, but your security in him is. Is your future, is your eternity in question? If you have never submitted your life to Christ in faith, believing, then the answer is yes. Your life is in jeopardy. The Savior has come. He came into this world. And he died with his arms held open wide. And he said, as many as believe in me, I will in no way cast out. He says, behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any should hear my call and come in, I will sup with him. He said that nothing is able to separate us from the love of God that is ours in Christ Jesus. But he came for his own. And his own are those who have turned their lives from sin and self and put their faith in Jesus Christ and in him alone for salvation. History belongs to Jesus Christ. He's been in control of it since the beginning. History began when he spoke this world into existence. And history will culminate when he comes back again. This time riding not on a donkey's colt, but riding on a steed of war. He will come back and he will put an end to everything that we ask him to put an end to today. We look around, we see what's going on in the world, and we say, why doesn't God do something? He already has. He has come into the world to redeem all who believe. He will return just like he said. He came the first time because of a promise. He is going to come back again because of a promise. And there's not a power on the face of this earth or anywhere else that is able to stop him. And he will come back at precisely the time chosen for him by the Father. When he returns, it will be to judge the living and the dead. Eternity is in the balance. It always has been. And he's always been in control of that too. One day every knee will bow and every tongue will will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. There will not be any dissent as there was on Palm Sunday. Every knee will bow and every tongue will confess. Mine will, yours will, and every other being on the face of creation is going to acknowledge that he and he alone is God. The question is, will you do so as a child of God? or will you do so as an enemy of the cross? The Bible says that we are to choose this day whom we will serve. And that's a choice you make. And if you have chosen to wait until a different time, if you have chosen that you don't like what it means to follow Christ, then that choice is one you will live with and you will die with. But if you have recognized him as the Lord, not in a generic sense, but in a very personal sense. He is my Lord. He is my God. He is my King, and I will serve Him. Then when you bend your knee and you confess that Jesus is both Lord and Christ, then you will be received in heaven with the same rejoicing that He was received in Himself. The Bible says, choose you this day whom you will serve. Well, I call on you to do that this day. You're not guaranteed tomorrow. None of us are. Only God knows when I will stand before him. I may stand before him through death. I may stand before him because of his second coming. I encourage you, make your heart ready today. Humble yourself before him. Pray this with me. Father in heaven, help me to believe. Father in heaven, help me to turn away from my sin. I confess my sin to you. I humbly acknowledge that you and you alone are God. 
I ask you, Father, for grace to believe and faith to trust you and faith to obey you. Now I pray, God, that you would touch your church, not an individual church, but the entirety of the body of Christ, all of those for whom the blood of Christ has changed their eternity, all who call upon the name of Christ in true faith and humble obedience. I pray, God, that you would turn your church back to yourself. And Father, I do pray for this nation. Father, I don't pray for this nation because I believe you love us more. But I acknowledge to you, Father, that you have blessed us beyond measure. And I confess to you, Father, that we have turned away from you. And I pray, God, that you would lead us to repentance. Father, your hand is upon us. You have caused us to turn our attention towards you. Father, many will turn their attention to you for a moment. And many will turn away and return to their old way. But I pray, God, that you would give grace that those who have not given their life to you will humble themselves this day and seek your face and by grace turn from their sin and follow you in Jesus' name. Amen. Jesus Christ said, come, follow me. That means more than church. Church is a part of it. It's how we gather together to worship him and to um, bring glory to his name. But he said, come and follow me. To be a follower of Christ is to be a disciple. We are to be disciples and we are to be disciple makers. I encourage you throughout this holy week, turn your eyes upon Jesus, as the song says. Look full in his wonderful face and the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. Let the glory and the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ turn your eyes upward, and may it turn your heart toward him, and may you be obedient to reach out in the love of Christ to others. In Jesus' name, amen. Yeah. Hey.